Well, I bring you greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the name that is above every name. Isn't it awesome to serve a living God? He's alive and well, and he's right there in your midst to be a part of what is going on in your life. And that is why we're here, to help encourage you in your faith walk. Today we're bringing you the powerful conclusion of the message we began last week. It's entitled, When You Pray and Nothing Happens. I am so looking forward to you hearing the conclusion of this message because it's dealing with uh, issues where we lose maybe loved ones, like I lost my mom back in 05, and it was a very hard and, and tragic death that we uh, experienced with her. And I use my own testimony of how we came through that to help encourage others. You may have lost someone that was very dear to you, and you haven't gotten past that yet because the hurt is still real. And maybe there's some anger toward God as to why he allowed this to happen. Today, there's going to be some revel revelation and some clarity brought from the Word of God that will help you to release that and to gain, gain victory over the enemy that's fighting you through the hurt. So be sure and check this out. I'll be back in a moment. Luke 7, 15. I just want to make sure you're awake. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all. I guess so. And they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. Then the disciples of John reported to him, to John, concerning all these things. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Get this, this is John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, the cousin of Jesus, who was filled with the Holy Spirit and fire in Elizabeth's womb, right? Are you the coming one? Are you the Christ? Or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And that very hour he cured many uh, of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Here John is sitting in prison awaiting to be executed <coughs> and he's doubting that Jesus is the Christ. Now we're talking about faith, right? You would think out of all the people, John the Baptist would have the strongest faith. But here he is sitting in prison awaiting to be e executed and he's doubting that Jesus is really the Christ. He had a faith eclipse, with, right? Something has gotten between he and God and has eclipsed his faith and, and his faith is failing him, right? If your faith is failing you, you will doubt that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, right? Now, let me ask you this question. What happened to John's strong faith? Before he was in prison and sentenced to die, he was out proclaiming that Jesus was the Lamb of God that's, uh, that takes away the, the sins of the world, right? Yep. Now... He's questioning Jesus' authority and identity as the Son of God. So let me ask you this question. It's totally unfounded. What if John had asked God to deliver him from prison and death and the answer didn't come? I can't prove that, but you can't disprove it. We don't know what went on in the prison the days and the hours before John's death. But we do know this. John had something happen to his faith, and he was now doubting Jesus as the Christ. What do you do when you ask for God to do something and it does not happen? Could this unanswered prayer be the reason John's faith in Jesus as the Christ was so shaken? What turned John's heart and shook his faith? Look there in John eleven seventeen. Yes, he was offended. But something had to shake him and cause him to become offended. John eleven seventeen. That was the account of John. I've told you about Simon, who I'm sure did not want to be sifted. You got John the Baptist, who surely did not want to be imprisoned and have, lose his head. 
And now look at this third uh, here in the story of Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. Look there in verse 17. Are y'all all right? And so when Jesus came, uh, they had told him Simon was, uh, I mean, Lazarus was sick, and he tarried two more days after he heard that he was sick. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb. Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women uh, around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord... If you had been here, my brother would, ha would not have died. In other words, we sent for you, and you did not come, and he died. That's, that's the same parallel or analogy of we prayed to you, and your presence did not come and deliver him from death, and he died, right? But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Mary said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said, yes, Lord. Watch this. Get this. Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Wow. Did you catch that? Look at the difference, the stark difference between John's response, are you the Christ or do we look for another? And Martha's response, I lost my brother because you wanted to hang out over there in Bethany a few more days. Thank you. But she still believed that he was the Christ. She did not have an eclipse of faith even though her, her prayer was not answered at that time the way she wanted it. Martha's and Lazarus' plea and Mary's for Jesus to come and heal him, Martha kept believing in Jesus as the Christ anyway. You see, <clears throat> when serious prayers, life and death prayers, aren't answered as in the way that we want them, this can open the door of our hearts to allow our faith in God and Jesus to be shaken and some even walk away from their faith in Christ. This has happened a lot. They lose a child tragically. They, they lose a spouse tragically, unexpectedly. They lose a, a, a parent tragically and unexpectedly. And, and they cannot answer that one question that haunts them. Why, God? And ultimately, they turn their back on God and walk away from Him. And then you have people like Martha that stays put. I don't like the fact that you waited. I don't like the fact that you did not answer our prayers when we called on you. I don't like the fact that my brother has been in the grave four days late, and now you show up. But I still believe you're the Christ. Give me five. So, do we have two churches? We have the church of the St. John's. All of them are offended. Don't believe in Christ, looking for another. And then you have the churches of the St. Martha's. They're ticked at him, but they love him. What do you do? How do you reconcile that church? You turn to Job. Job chapter 1. Get this. Job 1, verse 4. <clears throat> Job had seven children, and his children apparently liked to party. And it says, And his sons would go and feast in their houses, and each, uh, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would sin and sanctify his children, and he would rise up early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, look what the parents said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did 
regularly, or King James says continually. He did it continually, right? He sacrificed, he sanctified them from their junk. Then he sacrificed unto the Lord in an attempt to atone for their wrong so that God would have pardon and not destroy them. Drop down to verse 18. While he was yet speaking, three messengers came to him and told Job all the, the evil that was coming up on he and his family, his livestock, and everything that he owns. And while one of the uh, messengers was speaking, uh, uh, another came to him and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are all dead." And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshiped the Lord. Right? And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed, blessed, blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God foolishly or wrong. Wow. Wow a little bit different uh, attitude than John's, right? Now, watch this. Even though Job sanctified his children after they parted, and though he offered sacrifices and prayed unto God in case his children had cursed God while they were intoxicated and lifting, uh, living it up, none of Job's efforts were able to pre pre preserve his children from death. How did Job respond? Did he respond like John or did he respond like Martha? He did not charge God foolishly, nor did he sin. Now, if you're not careful, you can allow unbelief to fill your heart and you could become, listen to me, you could become cynical after you pray for a need to be met and God does not answer it the way you wanted Unbelief will cause you to become cynical and full of cynicism. Here's what it looks like. Why should I waste my time in prayer if God is just going to do what he wants to do anyway? If you know somebody that's angry at God, I'd, I would encourage you to get them this CD. Why should I waste my time going to church why should I waste my time in prayer? Why should I spend my money giving to the work of the Lord if God is just going to do what he's going to do anyway? Right? I, 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 I was crushed when I walked in, I believe it was that Friday morning that the Supreme Court said uh, that they had passed the law for, for same-sex uh, marriage to be uh, allowed in all 50 states of America. I walked in from prayer up and upstairs, and I came down, and Debbie was sitting on the end of our bed crying. And I said, what's wrong? And before she could answer me, I looked at the TV, and I saw why she was crying. We had been praying as a church. Churches all over America, around the world, were praying for, for the Supreme Court to strike that down. And guess what? None of the prayers were answered the way we wanted them. How many Christians are sitting in church today like this because God allowed that same-sex law to be passed? Angry at him. I'm not going to pray anymore. That's exactly what Satan wants you to do. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. A broken spirit no man can bear. Yet Job, staying up like a parent while their kids are out partying and having a good time, praying and seeking God's face and, and, and giving sacrifices unto the Lord that were under the law uh, acceptable to cover such a thing, and yet they, everyone died. Why pray? It might happen. It might not. Guess what? That's faith. I remember in 05, things were going good in the church. We had started in 01. 
We launched it, came here on 02 on the property. Things were going strong. We had the vision for this building. People were giving. People were being blessed. Miracles were happening. God was moving. He was blessing. Things were increasing. Then in 05, something happened. We started praying for uh, my mom. She was getting sick, and, and uh, she had a stroke. And, and we were praying, and nothing happened. She got worse. Then she got worse. She couldn't communicate with us, and she couldn't eat. She was starving to death. And so we changed our prayers. God, don't keep her. Take her. She stayed around. <laughs> it's like everything we prayed, the total opposite would happen. You ever been there? Yeah. And so... It was like for months there. She died. Then my brother-in-law died. And there was a bunch of them that died. And it's like, God, are you going to kill us all? Cynicism could have come into our hearts. But I remember that as, this, as if it were yesterday. I said, Lord, you're changing things. We've seen your goodness. We've seen how you've moved and how you've done miracles and how you've answered our prayers when we needed them. But now we're starting to see the other side where we pray and nothing's happening. Now that's where true faith is going to have to stand. Let me give you scripture. Nebuchadnezzar puts it in his mind. He says, uh, I believe I'm going to make everybody in here worship my idol. I'm going to create an idol, and everybody's going to bow down when the music comes, and, and they're going to worship this idol. And if they do, good. If they don't, they'll just perish in the fire, fiery, uh, fiery furnace. So he finds out Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego won't bow down. They won't worship his idol, and they won't uh, honor his decree. And so he comes down to him. He says, boys, I really don't want to destroy y'all with fire, so if y'all just work with me here, I I'll get you pardoned, but you got to bow down and worship. Here's what they said. They said, King, uh, we will not be careful to answer you this, but we will tell you. God will deliver us from the fire. But if he does not, be it known unto the king that we still won't bow our knees down to this image because we've already bowed to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, that's my paraphrase, but you get the point. They were going to worship God whether God answered and delivered them or whether God didn't answer them and let them burn to death. Now, this is going to be hard, but I got to say it. True faith won't walk away from God. Yet Simon, James, John, and the other uh, uh, eight did. John walked away. John the Baptist. You see these people in the Bible walking away. Jesus told the multitude. They followed him for a long time. And he said to them, unless you eat my, uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. You'll have no life in you. And, and they all walked away from him. And he looked at his own disciples and said, are you going to leave me also? People walked away from Jesus all the time. It happens, does it not? So we go through eclipses of faith where mom died. She died a horrible death. She lived a really good Christian life, walked close to God, prayer, prayed fervent prayers, had the power of God on her life. When she prayed, you knew something was going to happen. But she died a horrible death just like Billy Graham's wife. Same kind of uh, death. Starving to death. And you think, my God. It's hard on them, but it's even harder on the family. Because you're believing for them and you're seeing them wither away. And you think, what am I going to do? How do you recover once your faith is eclipsed? How do you recover from your faith failing you? Turn with me to Genesis 22. I'll let you go so y'all can go to the bathroom. <laughs> Genesis 22, 1. Now it came to pass after these things. We know what things, right? 
25 years of, of Abraham waiting on God, Sarah waiting on God for Isaac to come. Now Isaac is a young man. After all these things have come to pass, God tests Abraham's obedience and said to him, God does not test your faith. Satan tests your faith. God tests your obedience. God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, your only son, the only son that God recognized, whom you what? Love. How much do you think he really loved Isaac, he, the, the, I, the son of promise, the only son that's accepted by God? He loved him very deeply, right? Go to the land of Moriah and offer him. God is commanding him to offer up his only son as a what? Burn offering on one of the mountains to which I will tell you. So Abraham rose up when? Early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for burnt offering, arose, and went to the place of which God told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes, saw the place afar off, and you know the rest of the story. God tested Abraham's love. Abraham, get this, loved God more than his only son. Faith will allow you to love God more than anything on this earth. Watch this. Thank you, Lord. He can get me in some corners. And then when I think I'm about to drown, he shows up. He, he says, Abraham, yes, Lord. Take now your son, your only son. Offer him up. Okay. He got up early. Now, before he, he got this faith thing in his spirit, God would tell him to do something, and he'd lollygag for years. But now he's asking Abraham to take his son, his only son, and he's, he's got the chicken up and beating the chicken. He gets up early, saddles his donkey, and away they go to the mountain to, to sacrifice him. What is going on in Abraham? Wow. What's the moral of the story? You can't love anyone or anything more than God. Because if you love anything or anyone more than God, when that thing goes out of your life, you will hate God because you lost it and you'll blame him. Stand to your feet. Father, thank you for the wisdom, the revelation, the understanding you've given for your people to receive this word today. I believe in my heart that you're reaching out to people that are sitting at home angry at you because you allowed something to be taken out of their life that they loved obviously more than you and we asked you father to have mercy on them and let them get this word because unless you intervene it's not going to go well for that person they could literally let bitterness spring up inside of them and defile them and through bitterness defile others because they have a negative persona. They have a negative mindset about who you are now. And they want to blame you even though in your word you said it's the, the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but you have come that we may have life and have it to the full. So, God, we intercede for those that have lost loved ones, have lost their houses, have lost their land, their, their uh, career, their health. And they prayed, and nothing happened. We pray, God, that you will restore them back to right relationship, back to true faith in Christ, the Son of the living God. And that before they leave this earth, they will once again bow their knee and confess with their mouth and believe in their heart the Lord Jesus. Take the blinders off of hurting people today. You gave me this word as a prophet to speak to people in, in, who are weary so that they do not lose hope. May this give people hope 
and build their faith to come out of this dark prison like John was in and restore them. I ask it in Jesus' name. How many here today would say, this word was for me? I've allowed things that I've lost to cause me to be angry at God, to even at points be resentful toward God, and even had a little bitterness going on inside of me because I did not understand what you've taught today. But now because of the truth, I know the truth. The truth is setting me free. If that's you, raise your hand. <coughs> well, we're all out of time today, but before I leave you, I want to encourage you. If you know someone who has been hurt by a loss, maybe a loss of a, a job or career, lost their home, or maybe lost a loved one like a, a child or a parent that was very close and they just can't seem to, to grow past that point and the enemy is holding them in, in fear and, and anxiousness and resentment, maybe unforgiveness, and you would like to encourage them with this word, please order a CD or a DVD and, and just send that to them so that they can hear the truth and that truth that they know can set them free from the lies of the enemy. The, Satan loves to play on our emotions. He loves to play on our hurt, trying to turn our hearts against God. In fact, that's what he told uh, God whenever he wanted to tempt Job with trials and tribulation. He says, if you'll touch Job, Job will tur turn on you and curse you, God, to your face. That's what Satan wants to do is turn our hearts against God. But God says, I've sent Jesus Christ so that you may have life and have it to the full. So if you know someone that needs that, please get that for them and, and we'll get it sent out to them and it'd be a part of blessing their life and we would love doing that. Also, uh, if you have any prayer requests, please uh, send those in at prayer at whcnorth.org. We'd be glad to agree with you and stand with you in prayer. And then finally, if you would like to stand with this ministry financially, we need your support. Air time and production time cost us, and we need to uh, keep those bills paid so that this ministry and this voice can keep going forward. Will you be a part of that? Will you pray and ask God what you could do? The information to send the donations uh, is safe and secure. It's on our website. You can do it through PayPal, or you can mail the check to uh, our church office. The information is at the bottom of the screen, or you can look at our website, and it has all our contact information there. So until this time next week, Pray for us, and we'll be praying for you. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512. 